Okay, welcome back everyone. Nice to see so many of you back, even though it's getting a bit colder outside. Um, so, this week, as you can see, our, our lecture is going to be talking about construction. How did we come up with, you're all familiar with the moon, the, the, um, the, the only natural satellite of our, our planet Earth. You're all familiar with the moon, but all you'll see today is look at the, the mechanism that we use to form what we think forms the moon um, back in the Earth solar system. Now, if you remember the first Six lectures so far, what we've talked about, um, we've, we've talked about how we formed from a cloud of gas and dust, we formed a young star, our sun, and then around that star, we started to build up these young rocky bodies called we call planetesimals. These are the bodies up to 10, 100 kilometers in size. Um, these are the, the first solid bodies that are forming the solar system, and they go on to become, they are the building blocks of planets. So as these planetesimals start to fly, we build up. In the last couple of lectures, we've looked at the kind of processes that can occur when asteroids or planetesimals, when these kind of things collide at high velocities, different types of effects that can go on during one of those types of collisions. And today, what we want to do is then look and see um, a bit closer to home. We want to start to look at what happened with the moon, how did the moon come into being um, back in the solar system. And next week, the final, well, not next week, next week there is no lecture. Um, there's a then get the physical value. Um, if you go on the web to find out all the details about that. Uh, and in two weeks' time will be my final lecture um, to you, and we'll look um, specifically then at impacts on the Earth and, and different, um, some of the different impact events that have occurred on Earth and how that's affected our planet um, through time. So the moon, yes, the moon you're all familiar with it. Um, this is obviously when it's a full moon, you can see the whole surface. Um, the, the average orbital distance of the moon is around uh, 238,000 miles away from Earth. Its average radius is around 1,000 miles, which is around a quarter of the radius of the Earth. And its mass is uh, obviously also smaller than the Earth. It's around 180th of the mass of the Earth. And its average density we can measure as well, we can get an estimate of. Um, and we see that it's around 3,300 kilograms per meter cube. Compare that to the Earth, the Earth is about 5,500, something like that. So you can see that it's less dense than the Earth, and this is an important number, and we'll come back um, to discuss this in more detail later on. But you can see it's around 60% of the density of the Earth. So a bit of history of our observations of the Moon. Um, back in 1609, Galileo, um, with at the time most, um, the, the best telescope that had been uh, developed, started looking at the Moon, and he came to the conclusion that the Moon was a rocky body orbiting our planet. Um, he saw what he thought were hills and oceans on the surface of the moon. This is some of his um, sketches from, from when he was making his observations. He thought what he saw were hills and what he thought were oceans on the planet, and the speculation at the time was that there was probably humans living on Earth. Based on his idea that these were hills and, and, and oceans, we come up with the, the terminology for the different areas on the moon. Um, so the brighter island areas we call Terra. Uh, that's where the hills are, and the dark basin we call Maria, which is um, what I thought of for an ocean. So the Maria are these dark basaltic plains, you can see um, these big dark areas here, much darker in colour um, to our, to our uh, naked eye because they contain uh, more metallic elements, so they appear much darker. Um, and they're actually the result of basaltic um, of volcanism on the surface of Earth, filling up these large uh, basins. So these are nice big flat um, plains that are filled up with. A volcanic material um, basalt. The lighter <coughs> areas, we call the terra, um, these are, as I said, what we call the highlands, so they're highlands in these areas that are being filled with basaltic um, lava. They're older than Mari because they were here before the lava filled up these, these um, basins. Mm -hmm. um, and they're made of a rock we call them orthosite, which is a, um, a, a rock made up of feldspar and other um, minerals. As you can see, the dominant feature on the surface of the Moon, again, other than the volcanism, um, the dominant feature which we've seen on most bodies that we've looked at in detail so far this lecture series, um, is obviously impact craters. You can see um, all over the surface, completely covered with impact craters. This um, example here is um, actually, you can see this is Copernicus crater, which is inside one of these mare, this is Ingrium mare, and you can see this nice flat, smooth surface, much younger surface, being less cratered um, because it's a much younger surface. <clears throat> and cratering is still happening today, okay, it's happening a lot less frequently than it would have been in the early solar system, but we can still see evidence that craters are being formed on the moon today. 
This is a, 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 an image that was taken um, by Apollo 15 back in 1971, and you can see the evidence of lots of craters on the surface of the moon. If we look at this same region again with a photo that was taken in 2009 by the Elrock mission, you can see this crater here, um, encircled in red, this crater here, this bright spot, doesn't exist um, in the image from 1971. So this is a great example that I found this a, a week or two ago of, of an example of cratering still occurring on the moon. So this is still a process that's, that's going on. <coughs> so this is a crater that formed sometime in the last 41 years. We don't know exactly when. You know, sometime between these two images in the last 41 years. Crater. So what I want to do for the first part of the lecture is talk you through <coughs> what I'll call the classical formation mechanisms of the moon. So this is up until maybe around 30 or 40 years ago, the ideas that we had of how the moon was formed, and then we'll look at the, the evidence we have um, in support or against uh, those different mechanisms. So the first one is what we call fission. Um, this was suggested by uh, George Darwin, uh, George Darwin's son, in, 19, uh, in 1878. He suggested that possibly a large chunk of material split away from the Earth. The Earth was spinning, he thought, very fast. And as it spun so fast, this large chunk of material just split away from the side of the Earth and formed what we now know as the Moon. Four years later, a geologist called Austin Fisher was looking at the Earth and looked at the Pacific Basin, um, Pacific Ocean, and thought, well, up, nice and round. Maybe that could be the scar that was left behind because this big chunk of material split away from the Earth. The second theory that was um, thought to be a, a, a one way that we could have formed the Moon is Capture. This was suggested in 1909 by a gentleman called Thomas Jefferson, Jackson C. Um, he suggested that maybe the moon was just a planetesimal. It formed earlier in the solar system um, somewhere else, um, as all the other planetesimals were forming before the Earth. He thought maybe this was just wandering around and managed to come close enough to the Earth that the Earth's gravity captured it and pulled it in and, and kept it in, then stayed law. And the final mechanism that people had suggested up until the 1970s was what we call color accretion. So this is the idea that at the same time that the Earth was accreting from planetesimals all colliding and sticking together, the idea here was, well, what if the Moon also formed at the same time? What if there was a disk of material around the young Earth, and from that disk we then formed uh, the Moon in a similar kind of accretionary process, which is gas and dust and, and then planetesimals sticking together in low-velocity collisions. So they were the classical ideas of what we thought could be the formation mechanism for the moon. Um, now what we're going to do is talk you through some of the properties of the moon that we use to constrain our ideas of moon uh, formation. And then we'll apply these different uh, properties that we'll look at, some of these different observations. We'll apply those to each of those formation mechanisms and see how they hold up to the evidence. So the first observation, this is just a nice image that I've got. This is a view from Mars, this is uh, the moon see their relationship between each other. The first observation that's important is that the Earth-Moon system, so between them, the angular momentum of that system is very high compared to other planets and satellite systems. The uh, Moon is orbiting quite quickly. If you remove the Moon completely, the Earth would have to spin <coughs> the same angular momentum. The Earth would have to spin probably once every four hours or so. So it's quite a high angular momentum that the, the, the earth moon system has. Um, Coupled to that is the fact that the Moon has a much greater mass compared to the mass of the Earth than most of the satellites that we know of in the solar system, other than maybe Pluto and Charon. Um, all the other um, sat natural satellites that we know of are much smaller in mass compared to their host. <coughs> we also have samples of the Moon. We sent um, the Apollo mission in the 1960s and 1970s. We sent several spacecraft there. We collected samples of lunar rocks and brought them back. Um, we also have um, examples of meteorites that we know came from the moon. Um, they were split away in an impact or something and then had fallen to Earth and we collected them in Antarctica and other places. So we have samples of lunar rocks. So we can look at these rocks, we can look at their compositions, we can look at their um, radiometric ages to come up with an idea of when these rocks formed. Um, and then we can come, hopefully come up with some idea of the kind of uh, composition and structure of the moon based on these uh, rock samples. So the first um, idea we can come up from, from these is the idea we think that the moon formed relatively late given its size. You remember back to the, the early lectures we talked about the formation of planetesimals from um, the dust grains around the, the sun. 
those kind of planetesimals grew to uh, objects that were hundreds or, or, or more kilometers in size in just a few hundred thousand years after the formation of the solar system. Based on radiometric age data from the lunar rocks, for example, from the hafnium tungsten chronometer, it's just looking at the, the, the isotope of hafnium and tungsten, knowing the decay, um, decay product of hafnium going to tungsten, we can look at them and get an idea of what age we think these rocks were when they formed. And we actually come to the conclusion that the moon formed at least 30 million years after the solar system formed, possibly more, possibly 50 or 60 million years after the solar system formation. So then we come to think, well, how did the moon form so late? So how did the moon form so large, so much later than all the other planets formed in the solar system? Another consequence of the, the, the um, evidence we gathered from the Apollo missions is that we, we were able to look at the size of what we think the, the, the iron core within the, uh, the moon was. So the uh, Apollo astronauts left some seismometers on the moon, um, an array of seismometers. And so then they were able to measure um, ray paths of, um, well, we call them moonquakes, the equivalent of what we have as earthquakes on the Earth. Um, so as these moonquakes went off, they send waves through the Earth. And we were able to pick up their signal on seismometers that were dotted around on the surface of the moon. Based on those um, ray path data, the travel time data of these different things, different um, moonquake events, we can then, using some special techniques, we can come up with an idea of what we think the internal structure of the moon was exactly the same way that we do for the Earth to figure out the, the size of the mantle and the core in, in the Earth. We've done the same thing for the moon. And we come to the conclusion that actually we think the core is only around 330 kilometers as best kind of estimate, 330 kilometers in radius, which is only around 20% of the radius of the moon. Now, if you look to the Earth or other rocky bodies that we know have iron cores, they generally have a core that's around half of the radius of the body, whereas the moon, as I said, is only around 20%. So you can see that the moon's core seems to be anonymously small. Uh, and this could be an idea that can explain, as I said earlier, the moon has a lower density than the Earth. This could explain why the moon has a low density, because it's depleted in iron. Iron is a heavy element compared to the rocky material that we expect to be surrounding the iron core. So because we're depleted in this heavy element, we have a lower density for the whole of the moon. Another line of evidence that we take from um, our Apollo missions and the, and the rocks that we gathered from <coughs> is that we think that the moon, in the early um, stages of its life, had what we call a magma ocean. So this is an ocean on the surface. So imagine this is just a wedge taken from um, the, the moon. This is the surface here. What we think happened is we had a solid interior, there may be a, a, a molten core in the center. But we think on the surface we had a magma ocean. So this is liquid rock, um, so hot that it's melted, sitting on the surface of the moon. What happens when you have this liquid rock um, is that the lighter materials, the lighter elements, uh, lighter minerals, are able to sort of bubble up to the top of the, the, the uh, column of the magma and sit at the surface. And the heavier elements, because they're heavier, they sink to the bottom. So then we, we were able to look at the composition of the, the rocks that form the surface of the moon. The surface of the moon, the, the islands, the terra that we looked at earlier, are made up of a rock that we call the northern side, which is dominated by the glazed feldspar, which is just a, a mineral that makes up that rock. And this is a very low density rock. The, the, these feldspars are lower in density than olivine and pyroxene, which are the minerals which would have sunk to the bottom. This is kind of mantle material from the Earth. Because these are so much lower in density on the surface, this is how we come up to the conclusion that, well, that this is the mechanism that formed the surface, so therefore we must have had this magma ocean. The fact that we had a magma ocean on the surface of the moon early in its history suggests that there was a lot of energy available to the moon for, to be able to melt the surface and completely form this, this magma ocean. But if you remember, I said that the main heat source of objects in the solar system, in the previous lecture we looked at, one of the main heat sources is the decay of radionuclides, specifically for small bodies, the decay of short lived radionuclides. But if you remember back to the asteroid lecture, we looked at this and we came to the conclusion that actually these short lived radionuclides, these important ones that formed most of the heating, aluminium 26 and iron 60, they would have decayed in the first 5 to 10 million years of the solar system, and then they would no longer be efficient at heating. Well, I just told you that the moon formed probably 30 million years or more after the formation of the solar system. So where did this heat source come from? So this is another constraint that we have on our formation mechanism. We need to be able to explain why the surface of the moon was so hot soon after formation. 
So just to summarize those constraints and what we'll look at when we're trying to explain how the moon formed, first of all, we want to be able to explain the high angular momentum of the Earth and moon system. Secondly, we want to be able to explain why the, the, the moon is lower in density than the Earth and why it seems to have a small iron core compared to what we'd expect for these kind of bodies that differentiate. Third, we want to be able to explain the late formation time of the moon compared to what we would expect for this size of body in the solar system. We also want to be able to explain how we formed a magma ocean on the surface of the, uh, of, of the moon. And finally, this is another um, strength that I didn't actually talk about yet, but we have isotope data from oxygen, titanium, tungsten. I'll talk about this in more detail as the lecture goes on. But basically, we can look at the isotopic composition of the moon and compare it to the isotopic composition of the Earth and see that actually these are very similar, or if not, if not identical, in their isotopic composition. But when we look to other planets or other asteroids or meteorites, we see that actually composition vary from body to body. It's, un it's unheard of for two bodies to have an identical isotopic composition for their different, uh, these different isotopes. So that leads us to think that maybe these, the Moon and the Earth, had a common origin. Um, so this is another, um, another constraint that we'll use to try and um, determine which of these different formation mechanisms is uh, most likely to be uh, the one that formed our Moon. So, these are the different constraints. I mean, there are others, but these are some of the five uh, key constraints. How do these constraints fit with the classical formation mechanisms that I um, just introduced? Well, let's first look to the fission um, idea, where we have this chunk of the Moon split away from the Earth that was spinning quite quickly at the beginning. This would explain the lack of a large core in the Moon. If, if all this material came from the mantle of the Earth, it would then be depleted in iron, and that would explain why the Moon has a, low, a, a small core and a depletion of iron in its composition. And you could explain the oxygen isotope similarities. It could explain why these two bodies appear to have come from a common, uh, common origin. But there are some problems. Um, it's thought that uh, people have done uh, models of this kind of formation mechanism and that the spin rate we would need the Earth to have for it to actually lead to this, uh, this material um, flying off from the, 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 uh, the Earth. This spin rate is actually thought to be very fast, and it's un we're unsure how you get such a high spin rate to cause this type of process to occur. Secondly, the Pacific Basin, which we just speculated, could be the scar left behind as this chunk of rock splits away from the Earth. We actually know now that that Pacific Basin only formed around 70 million years ago whereas the moon formed around four and a half billion years ago. So these are two completely unrelated events. We, we know that the Pacific Basin wasn't the scar left behind from the moon. The moon's orbit and Earth's equator are actually not quite co plane if, if you have the, the, the Earth spinning so quickly that something splits away, you'd expect whoever splits away from the Earth to be orbiting around the same plane as the equator of the Earth, the, 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 the same spins that the, the Earth has. But actually, they're not quite co plane So then we would need to explain why is the moon not quite on the same plane as the Earth's orbit. And then we can't quite explain that using this method. And finally, the moon has um, a, a, a depletion not only of iron, but also some volatile elements on uh, its composition. And this mechanism, when you, you run the calculation, doesn't quite explain why you would have a slightly different composition. You may have the same isotopic composition, but it can't explain why you'd have a different composition in, in the number of volatile so, we came to the conclusion after we'd been to, to the Moon and the Apollo uh, missions, we came to the conclusion that probably this isn't the mechanism that formed our Moon. So next, let's look to the capture mechanism. Um, this could explain why we have these compositional differences. I've told you that there are some differences in the volatile composition on the Moon and in the iron. If it came from a separate body, a separate decimal formed elsewhere, then this mechanism could explain that. But it wouldn't necessarily be able to explain why we have a small core. If it was a planetesimal that formed independently on its own, you'd expect its core to be the same size relative to the body as all the other cores that we see in bodies in the solar system. It wouldn't also be able to explain the isotopic similarities. Unless this body formed in the same orbital distance around the sun, you couldn't really explain why it would have a similar isotopic composition. And also, people have looked at this in, in more detail and thought, well, what would we actually need to happen for this body to get captured in an orbit around the sun, what kind of scenario would lead to this being captured? And when you look at all the different scenarios, you see that actually the two, by far the two most common events would be either that you would get slightly too close to the Earth and impact the Earth, or you would come around and have some kind of a slingshot event and get flown, flung away from the Earth. 
Brent Fur the body to be able to slow down and caught into an orbit around the Earth is extremely rare. And so, again, based on these um, problems we have with the, the mechanism, we think the capture probably isn't the mechanism that formed the Earth. So what about the co accretion mechanism? This was the most popular theory up until the 1970s. Um, it doesn't require a low-frequency event like the capture. It doesn't need a body to come within range and get caught in the orbit of the Earth. So this was quite a nice theory. But well, actually, yeah, this, this all fits. It's nice and simple. Just the moon formed at the same time as the Earth. They all formed together a time ago. But then it can't explain why the ion content is different between the, the Earth and the moon. And it can't explain also why we have such a large angular momentum for the Earth and the moon system. If, if it just all formed as the Earth was spinning, then why, why would we have such a high angle of momentum compared to other planets that we have in the solar system? So based on those ideas, in the 1970s, we came to the conclusion after we'd been to the moon that actually probably this doesn't quite fit. We've got ideas of, what, of how we came to the moon before. So if it wasn't the fission mechanism, if it wasn't the capture mechanism, and if it wasn't the co accretion mechanism, these would be the only three mechanisms that really anyone gave any uh, time and day to up until the 1970s. It wasn't any of these three mechanisms, what could it have been? So after Apollo, we came to the conclusion we needed a new theory to explain the origin of the moon. And that's where we enter uh, the giant impact hypothesis. So this is going back to some of the things we're talking about through the lecture series as a whole. Impacts between bodies are an important event that can have a range of different so in the mid-1970s and the 1980s, a new theory was uh, first suggested in 1975 by Harman and Davis in a paper. Um, they suggested that maybe a giant impact could form a moon. Um, and in 1984, there was a conference where many of the leading scientists in the field gathered together to discuss this and try and come up with a, a consensus of how they could moon form. And that was when this theory really started to catch hold. So the idea is you have an object that comes and it impacts with the young Earth throws a lot of material into a debris disk around the young Earth, and then from that disk we then coalesce into what we know as the moon today. In 2001, and again in 2004, a researcher called Robin Cannon from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, um, she's been modeling the, the impact. She built on earlier models from 1989 by a, a group who also run um, simulations of the moon. She runs some high resolution models, and, and these have really been, for the last 10 or 12 years, um, some of the most um, generally accepted ideas for how the moon can form. So in her model, she has an impact of a Mars-sized body of the Earth. It's around the size of Mars. We call it the Earth. In literature, if you read about this, people generally call this body that they think impacted the Earth. It has a name, the Earth. The idea was that the impact would occur at an angle of around 42 to 50 degrees. And that glancing, well, not quite glancing impact, but that angle of impact was what then led to the development of some of the angular momentum of the Earth moon system. And that still remains some of that angular momentum today. So if we just look at this simulation, here we have a, um, a snapshot of this simulation just after the impacts occur. So here's the Earth, here's the impact point, and here's some of the material that's being sort of thrown down range after the impact occurred. The different colours here just represent different temperatures um, of the material. So red is hot material. And as we run this material through, we've actually just zoomed out slightly. You can see that we have the Earth here, we have this material that has all been flung away from, from the, the Earth in this impact, forming this kind of arm, if you like, that's going to spin around the Earth. Um, we start to form clumps of material, but some of them then become so close to the Earth that they actually kind of get split apart by the Earth's gravity as they come too close. But you can see towards the end of the simulation here, what we have is a, a disk, this red area here is the Earth. We have this big disk of material all around the Earth that um, is likely then to go along and coalesce and then fall into the moon. You can see the material starting to come together to form the moon. This is then a new edge on from the, the, what we have been looking at was the, the final mission. Here it was looking top down onto the area, so you can see this disk here. If you look at that edge on, you can see we formed kind of a, a nice disk. Around the, Earth, around the Earth, so that would then, as I said, that disk would then go on to form the moon. We can even look at a, a, a movie of uh, at this simulation. So here we go as the impact occurs. We then get all this material kind of rotating around the Earth. You can see then this, um, this rotation occurring. You can see these objects as they get too close to the Earth getting split apart by the Earth's gravity and, and forming these kind of long arms of material then orbiting the Earth. Here we go, another one's probably come too close. But you can get an idea then after this impact why we have so much rotation and how we can form this kind of um, 
um, high angular um, you get another one that gets further past, it comes too close. But this gives you an idea of how, because of one of these joint impacts, we can develop that high angular momentum that we saw um, we need to develop in our model of the moon. And in these kind of simulations that um, Kenneth ran, she determined that the composition of the moon was probably made up of around between 40 and 60 percent of the material of the moon came from the body that impacted the Earth, not from the Earth itself. And this is an important number that we'll come back to. How long would that event have taken? Probably hours, I think. Uh, well, the actual, here we were at 21 hours at this point. The then formation of the things into the moon would take a lot longer. That would be a different time scale than the thing we the particles start to collide together. But the actual impact, what I just showed you, that was around 21 hours. So this idea, is this a success? Does this match all of our observations of how the moon would form? Well, it, as I said, it explained our angular momentum. You saw the spin of the, the Earth and the moon as this um, event went on. So yeah, we can explain the angular momentum. It can explain the low iron content and small core, because this material, most of the, okay, I said 60% of the material came from the impact, but that means 14% of the material came from the Earth. And actually, predominantly, that came from the mantle of the Earth, which is, as you know, this rocky material is depleted in iron as well, because all the Earth's iron is sunk to the core. So again, we can explain using this kind of mechanism why we would have a low iron content and then a, therefore a smaller core on the moon. You can imagine that this impact event could happen at any point in the history of the Earth. So explain why the moon formed so late, as I said, at least 30 million years after the solar system formed. That's easy to do with this mechanism as well. And the amount of energy deposited in this kind of impact, you can see that all this material is quite hot. As this goes into the moon, it can then easily explain why you have so much energy to form a magma ocean on the surface of the moon soon after it formed. So that's great, we can explain all these different uh, constraints using our model of um, an impact. But there's one constraint that's not so easily explained. Um, I told you earlier we have a measurement of oxygen, titanium, tungsten, all these different isotopes that we've measured between um, the moon, uh, from the rock brought back from the moon or from the lunar meteorites, and we've measured it on the Earth. Uh, this figure here is just a plot of different titanium isotope measurements. So that this is um, what we do on these plots is we plot at zero what things are on the Earth, and then if we're um, if we have an excess of a particular titanium isotope, we'll plot to the right. If we have a completion of that particular isotope, uh, titanium 50, we'll plot to the left. And you can see that this is for then different groups of bodies. So this is carbonaceous chondrites, and spike chondrites, ordinary chondrites. Um, these are different A chondrites. You can see that they will plot in different areas, uh, different um, isotopic anomalies from the, the value of the Earth. And this is what you'd expect for different bodies as they form. They will all have different uh, titanium uh, isotopic and up until a few years ago, this was an easy, we could easily explain we, the, the measurements that we had of these were not accurate enough that we had fairly large error bars on these measurements, that we could think, we could fool ourselves into thinking that, well, actually, maybe the Earth and the Moon are sufficiently different, that this isn't a problem with our uh, impact hypothesis. But in recent years, this was a paper by um, uh, Zhang et al. Uh, Zhang was one of our colleagues in the department of uh, geoscience, uh, geophysics uh, in the University of Chicago. Um, just a few months ago, it published this in Nature Geoscience, came to the conclusion that once now we have much more accurate measurements of the titanium isotope of these kind of meteorites. Came to the conclusion that actually Earth and Moon are indistinguishable. And this is a story that's not just true for titanium, it's also true for tungsten, it's also true for oxygen. So for all these different, um, all these different elements for which we have isotope data, we come to the conclusion that the Earth and the Moon have the same composition, and therefore they either must have come from one single body, or they came from an impact where the Earth and the Moon and all the material that formed both of those bodies were so well mixed during that impact or formation event. Those bodies are so well mixed that you can no longer tell the two different signatures of the two bodies apart. As I said, this um, model from Robin Canop of, of the lunar formation back from 2004, she had the moon being made up of 60% material from the impactor, around 40% from the Earth. But the Earth didn't really have any impact material, it was negligible the amount of material from the impactor that ended up on the Earth. So in that case, you would expect to have these two different bodies, the Earth and the moon, should have a different isotopic composition. But they don't. 
to how can we say if they're joining that hypothesis? Can we come up with a way to explain why these two isotopic compositions of the Earth and Moon are so similar, even though we've been spent um, based on the theory for them to be good? Now, the first idea that we came up with was well, what if the Earth and the Earth come from the same orbital distance around the Sun? They formed it from the same disk of material around the Sun, but just in separate areas, you know, they were orbiting in a different area at the time, but they were still at the same distance from the Sun. That would explain why they would build up the same isotopic composition. This is isotopic composition is generally a function of the distance of the material from the Sun at the time. But if this is true, you can't really account for why the formation time of the Moon was so late. So if these two objects formed at the same orbital distance, they're so large that you would expect one of them to have impacted the other much sooner than at least 30 million years, maybe after 60 million years. You can't really explain why this impact took so long to occur. So it's probably not this. This probably isn't, doesn't really help us explain these different isotopic compositions. The second idea was, well, what if after the impact, all this material kind of vaporized the moon, all the material thrown out to the degree disk, what if it was so hot that some of it was in a vapor phase that you could have material kind of exchange between the two, you could get some exchange going on between the, the, the Earth and the, the disk form the moon. And then because you get all this kind of exchange, you can get nice stops equilibrium between the other. So this works for things like oxygen has been shown that could probably work for oxygen, which will stay um, in the vapor phase for a long time. But for what we call refractory elements, those that would um, condense out of that paper phase quite quickly, things like tungsten and titanium and silicon, you can't really explain that using this mechanism. They wouldn't stay in that um, paper phase for long enough to get enough exchange occurring. And so therefore, again, this idea could help to explain it, but it doesn't really give us a full understanding of why the isotopic composition between the two, between the Earth and the Moon, is so similar. And up until a month ago, was where we got. This, this model was um, published maybe last year, and this was kind of the latest and greatest where we got to, and our current understanding of how the moon formed. And it was, you know, we were sort of thinking, well, maybe it's something else, maybe it isn't a giant impact hypothesis, people making the system. That was about as far as we got. And that was about as far as I was going to go with the lecture. Um, and when I planned this lecture series, I, I was going to get to here, and we were going to say, well, we don't really know how the moon And I was going to then tell you about it, and I'll bring it back to the moon, and kind of spend the last 10 minutes but, about a month ago, three papers came out, independent of one another, coming up with ideas that we could use to then explain um, how we come across this uh, obstacle for the giant impact hypothesis. So I've added these few slides to the end of this updated version of giant impact hypothesis. So I'll just give you an, a, 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 an overview of these three papers, which are still ideas in their infancy, but they could explain how we could get over this, this problem. Now, two of these papers use a common idea of how, how we could overcome this problem. So, the reason, one of the, the, the reasons that the, the Kant model came to the conclusion that the, the impact she presented was the one that could form the moon, one of the constraints she was using was that her impact had to generate enough angular momentum during the impact um, that you could then match the angular momentum of the Earth and the moon today. So, that was kind of a constraint on the type of impact she could look at. She couldn't look at things that were too impacts that were too small because they couldn't generate enough angular momentum. She couldn't look at impacts that were too large because they might forget too much. So she was limited in her uh, approach of, of which type of impact she could use. Recently, people have suggested, well, what if there was some other impacts that caused this kind of high rotation before the impact of the moon? So the Earth was already spinning faster than we wanted it to spin. What if it was already spinning fast enough? And then the moon, the, the moon forming impact came along um, once it was already spinning. And then you say, well, would there be too much angular momentum? And they've come up with a theory, I'm not going to go into any detail before I fully understand this, but they've come up with an idea that, well, if the moon and the, the Earth form it, fall into a bezonance, this is the same kind of process that we've looked at for the asteroids and we've, and, and, uh, um, we've looked at several times for the lecture series, these kind of resonances with the sun, different planets. If we fall into a resonance, maybe that could then remove some of the excess angular momentum from the Earth and after um, the, the formation. So, don't worry about the fact that we've changed the amount of angular momentum. We, they have a, a mechanism to explain that. The first of these models, then, is uh, by uh, Cook and Stewart. Um, these are researchers from Harvard. And their idea, as I said, they want to have uh, a spinning Earth before the impact. Their impact is actually much smaller than the impact that um, was used previously. So uh, I can't remember the exact size, but it's smaller than Mars, so smaller than the one that um, in Kant's original model. 
And because it doesn't need to generate as much angular momentum, the, the impact it can have on much smaller mass, okay, it might have a higher velocity, so it throws more material up to form the moon. But because the impact has a smaller mass, that will then form the lower uh, mass fraction of the resulting moon, and that then won't influence our isotopic composition as much, and we'll have closer isotopic composition between the moon and the Earth. So this is one way that they, they've come up with that can explain these isotopic similarities, but you also still explain, still so keep with the, the idea that we have you know, impact that would then be depleted, in, the, the, the disk would then be depleted in iron, and fit the other constraints still. So this is one way that could be possible. So by removing that limitation of the type of impact we need, by removing that type of that, um, that limitation that we need to generate all that angular momentum, they came up with an impact that could then go on. And you can kind of think of this almost as a hybrid of the giant impact hypothesis and um, George Darwin's fission hypothesis. Because we need the Earth to be spinning so fast, all we then need is just some event to help us to throw that material away from the Earth and form the moon. In his hypothesis, he didn't have any particular mechanism to get that material to give it the kind of trigger to, to come off the Earth. The second model was um, actually an update by Robin Hannah, whose model I showed you earlier. So she then came up with a site that rather than taking a spinning Earth and taking a smaller impact. She said, well, what if we take an impact that's actually similar in size to the Earth? So she, in this case, I mean, her impact was actually around 40% of the uh, mass of the Earth, as opposed to around 10, 12% of the mass of the Earth in her previous models. And in this case, what she thinks is that, well, we have this impact that occurs, because these two things are so similar in size, actually you form this kind of big blob of material that all just mixes everything up together after the impact. Then as it's spinning so fast, you get these arms of material that come off away from the moon, which would then go and form our disk, and from that disk we're going to form the moon. But the idea here is that the two bodies, that the Thea and Earth, collide, they collide, they're so similar in size that they completely mix all their material together, and that would remove any isotopic signature from one or the other body. And you'd be left with two bodies that would have a similar or not different identical um, isotopic so again, this is one way that we can explain those differences in our isotopic composition. And the third alternative didn't actually go to any of that trouble of needing the Earth to be spinning and needing some kind of resonance with the Sun. They just took the original idea that we needed to, um, the, the same kind of impacts that we've been looking at back in 2004, but then just assumed that, well, what it was what we call a hit and run collision. So this is a kind of class of collision that's gaining more traction for different ideas in recent time. The idea is that the impact is so low angles, kind of a glancing impact, that the impact would actually fly off downrange and you know, keep going so fast that it doesn't get caught up by the gravity of the Earth. But in doing so, as it hits the Earth, it actually throws a lot of material up into this disk around the Earth. And that material that's been kind of thrown into this disk around the Earth by the impact is then what goes on to form the moon. So they have a high, high velocity, low incident angle, quite a small impact. And they do this, they form this disk. The impact it goes off doesn't get involved in forming the moon. And therefore, the disk that goes on to form the moon would have a similar composition, if not an identical composition, to the Earth that it formed from. So that's one more way that we could possibly explain um, the formation of the moon. So then, as I said, that was kind of that's the latest results. That's within the last month those three papers have come out. So in summary, what we've shown then is that impact, once again, more than likely played a key role in shaping our solar system. They, it's more than likely that an impact was the event that formed our moon um, around the Earth. The full details of that impact are still not completely resolved. As you've just seen, <coughs> this is still work that people are doing um, right to this day. And over the next few years, as people start to look at these three different models and start to really kind of interrogate them to try and see which of them is the better one, it's going to be a really exciting time to kind of find out which of these different models could possibly fit all of our observation and explain the formation. <coughs> And with that, I'll thank you and invite any questions. Yes. Yes. Uh, there are many satellites in the solar system. Would you suggest that this is a general mechanism of the for every satellite? The question is, there are many satellites in the solar system. For example, if you look at Saturn and Jupiter, they all have lots of planets, uh, lots of um, moons around them. And is this a general formation mechanism that's formed? And actually, it's got probably not. I think the Earth, the Earth's moon is special, if you like. It's so much larger in comparison to the Earth than any other satellites that we need some different formation. The moons of Jupiter and Saturn, 
it's thought that they actually probably formed with this co accretion mechanism. So the idea that as Jupiter was forming, you had this disk of material around. So and then the moon. Is it mechanism for the other satellites? First of all, I'm telling you, the co accretion mechanism that I told you earlier in the lecture. The idea is that as Jupiter was forming, you have this disk material that everything's forming out of. And the idea is that those would then go on to form um, the moon and Jupiter and Saturn. It may be that other moons some moons are formed by this mechanism. We don't know. Um, but this is generally really the idea for the Earth. And, and as I said, Earth's satellite is different to most other satellites. Have you seen any you ask, do we see any similar satellites in exoplanets, for example? Well, I don't think we have a good enough resolution on any planets outside our solar system that we can be able to see their moons yet. We're just at the point where we can see the planets orbiting the sun. I don't think we've got to the point where we can see the moons orbiting those planets. But I, I, I don't quote me on that. I don't think. Uh, some of the information that we have uh, indicates that the moon is still moving away from the Earth, and it was much closer uh, three and a half to four billion years ago. Uh, can you account for that in some of your models? The question is, can you account for the fact that the moon is moving away from the Earth? Um, it's much further now than it was three and a half billion years ago. Yes, I think actually that's accounted. I think if you if you look at the the, the angular momentum, I think it's all accounted for in that as it's, this is going around the, the side, you would actually you would expect it to move. I don't have the full details of that mechanism, but I'm fairly sure that that's a case. In the hit and run hypothesis, if Thea wasn't incorporated into the Earth Moon system, is there any evidence where it ended up, or has there been any search for this body? The question is if the hit and run collision is the one that formed the moon, what happened to the impact? Do we know where that is? Is that the question? Now, where did Thea end up if it wasn't incorporated in the Earth right. Moon system? Well, I mean, this is something that happened four and a half billion years ago. We have so many objects in the solar system, the asteroid belt, for example. We have, actually, we know that since the asteroid belt formed, we've lost 99% of the mass of all those objects. Things have fallen into the sun, or they've gone around the sun and been flung out of the solar system. So, hunting for one body that's probably 10% of the mass of the Earth, four billion years after we think it may have been near the Earth, is going to be a, a difficult task. I think. I think no one's tried to look for it because I think it's just a task that you'd, you'd never, you would never be able to know whether you found it or not because we don't know what we would be looking for. Would the Earth be ejected from the solar system? Well, again, that, that would depend on the, the impact, it would depend on what angle the impact comes in. We don't know. I mean, if, if it's if it's in this hit and run collision, it could be ejected from the solar system, it could get it could go down to the Earth, it could go into a different planet crossing orbit, it could be in Jupiter. We just don't know where it could go. I mean we, we don't know the full conditions of that impact. All we can say is the angle that it hit the Earth would then go on to form the moon. But we don't know which angle that's going. We don't know that's then pointing towards the sun, pointing away from the sun, we, we just don't know. Yes. Uh Observationally, the far side of the moon is structurally much different than the near side. What would account for that? I think yeah, your question is why, why is the, the far side of the moon different than the near side? I think it's, it's a result of impacts on the, on the moon. And I think the, the, because the near side of the moon is always facing the Earth, I think you have a, selection, a selective effect of where the impacts would be most likely to fall. But I don't know the exact answer. Yes? Yeah. Um, when images that are taken of uh, Mars moons, Phobos and Nanos, they do look like asteroids, and Mars is the closest planet to the asteroid belt. Yeah. But, and it might suggest capture, but uh, I, I've heard that uh, the lack of eccentricity of the orbits suggests that it couldn't have been captured. The capture of would be far more elliptical. Uh, any word, further word on that one? Uh, I think that's about as far as I've read about it as well. I haven't read any more recent data, uh, recent studies that could suggest a, a, a more of a, a knowing more about it. I, mean, I think the idea is it could be captured, it could be an impact, it could be something, but I don't think it will be tells of one. Yes? yes. Uh, you said we're, we're right on the cutting edge. 
Yeah. Yep. Nice one. Uh, could you go back to your first slide for a second? Your, your title, uh, with the, most, the real big picture. Okay. Yeah. That impact crater, uh, that must have been. This one? Yeah. That must I have think. been tremendous with the wall we uh, raised in that. Do we know what's the, you know, the name of that? No idea. It's called Typhoon. Or Typhoon. It's actually named after Typhoon Brea, mm -hmm. whose observations we've been looking at quite a lot during this lecture series. He was. Boss, uh, it's called Why we have these big rays, I'm not completely sure. I think what the idea is that we, we formed, formed, it fell into some kind of blue sediments and it just threw material so far away, but I, I don't know the full idea behind that. But it's, it's interesting, it's, it's one of these craters that's got such a large reach, you can see it you know, so far away, the crater itself is actually quite small compared to some of these larger impact basins which form, you know, these huge basins up here. It's a small crater, but it has a large footprint. It's a really interesting crater. Um, but I don't know exactly why, I can't remember the exact details of why we have these lines. I'm, I'm old enough to remember. Uh, we didn't know. We, we, don't, we never see the other side of the moon from the Earth. And uh, before, it was only until the first time. Yep. Was it one of the explorers that went around? Because the impact is so fast, you create a shock wave that goes through, and it's actually 
you overcome the strength of the material and it acts like a liquid. Um, so actually, within probably hours or days, it will probably return back to its variable size. At the time, you know, the time that we're talking about this formation of the moon, we're back in the time when the Earth was probably still very hot anyway. If it, if it wasn't liquid on the surface, it was close to it, so it would be easy for it to then reform into its variable size. That's another bonus of the impact theory, actually, um, is the fact that it could explain why the axis of the Earth is, you know, not central. Um, it's one idea that, you know, after this impact theory came up, you could say, well, actually, yeah, that's a bonus. You could explain that. I'm not sure how much it's been looked into, but it is, yeah, that is one possible answer. Yes? Well, I think it's the idea there are other planets with axes that are extremely far from uh, perpendicular to. Well, yeah, I mean, that, if you look to the, the ice cores. Is it Nep Neptune? Is yeah, and if you look at Neptune, that, that, that was so far off, off axis. And the idea there, again, is that, that could have been a big impact and then caused that to be off, off axis so much. Yes? Well, is the Pacific Ocean the result of the, uh, impact? Uh, was the Pacific Ocean the result of the impact? No, I don't think it was. And I don't think there's, there's any real evidence that would suggest it. It's more likely to be the result of, of tectonic circulation spreading. Given the relative density and masses of the two bodies, uh, would uh, gravitational frictional uh, agitation contribute to the uh, differences in the moon structure? I'm not sure I understand the question. Do you repeat the question? I was thinking in terms of the, uh, uh, the uh, tidal heating, which would occur if the moon were very close and, of course, going around the Earth at much greater uh, velocity. It would contribute to the heating in the moon itself, in the core of the moon. Yeah, it could do. I, I'm not, I, I'm just, I, I guess that's been looked at, but I've not seen those results. But I, I think, yeah, that, that could be a consequence uh, of, of, the, of the moon. We, we do have some images. Uh, actually, one of the images I showed you today was of the eastern side of the moon, so not quite the same. This image here, actually, the eastern side. That's the side we normally see. Yeah, you look at the side we normally look at um, is this side where you have all these kind of large um, lamari. So if you then look to this area, you know, some lamari you can see. So it's not completely the opposite side, but some of this is the side of it. Now, what, what the spacecraft would <coughs> This is one of the hollows, I think. Uh, I can't remember which one it was. I can't remember. It was one of the hollows. If you go on the NASA website, just search for Apollo missions, you can find that all these images are up this great, great resource. What effect would any of these light, lighter theories have on the amount of water on the Earth before and after the collision? What effect would this have on the amount of water? Um, I don't know if that's been looked at yet. I mean, these are so young, these models. I guess that would depend on the composition of the impactor, whether that had any water. You know, there's theories that suggest that actually some of the, the water on Earth could have been delivered by comets. Um, I, I don't know how these would affect our ideas of where that was. I haven't read anything about that yet. So it wouldn't disperse most of the water, for instance, irretrievably? It, it's possible. I mean, it could, it could be that you um, vaporize a lot of that water and lose it. That could be one consequence, yeah. Does the moon and its gravity act as a kind of a fly paper for asteroids to attract them to the moon instead of hitting the Earth, or is there no moments? I think there is some evidence that um, the moon could have taken some of the impacts that, you know, could have acted as a, as you say, a flight bit, could have acted as a kind of defense. I don't know the exact numbers, but I, I think there is some evidence of that. I'll look it up and try and put it in next week's lecture, or two weeks' time. Yes? Uh, 
there's been some recent conjecture that the far side of the moon is different from the near side because it was impacted by a relatively small but uh, uh, high velocity impact Do you have any th th thoughts on that? Uh, not at this time, no. I, I haven't really seen that, that research in any detail, so I don't want to speculate about something like that. That impact that you showed us after the Apollo mission in that area, mm -hmm. the recent impact within 40 years, do you know the size of that? No, I don't actually know the size of it. This is a, in one way it's a great image because it shows it, in another way it's a bad image because there's no scale bar. Um, so I don't know exactly the size of that. I don't think it's a very particularly large range. I think these are fairly, you know, kilometer scale, probably a tenth of a kilometer. Yes. On any future uh, craft landing on the moon, do you have a preference on where it would go? Or where it would learn? Do, you have any... do I have a preference where we would send a, a craft to the moon? I think the, 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 the poles are interesting regions. The, the idea of, of water on Mars, uh, water on the moon. Uh, I, th I think there are so many interesting regions that you know, pick one is it. You know, the question of whether we'll actually ever get back to the moon is another, another question. Are the seismology instruments that have been placed on the moon still work? All the results I've seen from them were from the 70s. I don't know if we have, I don't know if they're still active today. They may well be, but all the you know, all the results that we we're looking at was that they it was fairly recent some of the results that we were looking at, but they were reanalyzing the data from the 70s as opposed to new. Yes. What research have you done on the Mars Rover? Yes. What research are you involved in yourself now, which is related to this? Actually, the past couple of weeks' lectures. The collisions on asteroids, that's, that's my research. So a lot of the results I've shown in those two weeks are my own research. I don't really look at the moon in any detail, that's not my area. I mean, the impact theory is, you know, related to what I do, but I don't actually actively research any of the moon. Okay, last question. You mentioned Mars. What are the news um, media reported that Mars got the discovery? Mission was going to have some startling news in a couple of days. Did we get that? Or was very soon it was going to be startling news? I've not heard it yet. <laughs> the, the big news I did hear was actually not related to um, not related to Mars. It was the, the discovery of water on Mercury was announced just maybe two days ago. Which was a big yeah, that was a big um, big. Uh,